Chapter 15. Pete Condon Talks. Hauling here, bawling there, steadily, readily, cheerily, merrily, still from care and thinking free is a sailor's life at sea. Chorus from Jack the Guinea Pig. Joe Bloom stuck his head and shoulders out of the galley door to add his voice to the clatter of the mess boy's bell. Come and get it, you thundering squareheads, or I'll throw it out. Men, near enough to hear the cook's voice, straightened up from wrestling with the piles and looked dazedly toward the galley. Their weary minds were slow to understand, and their exhausted bodies still slower to respond. Along the deck, farther aft, and on the swaying yard arms overhead, men stopped to listen to the bell, then duly resumed their work. Food. They were almost beyond caring. Who should eat first? Whose watch was it? No one remembered. Since the mate's cry of all hands on deck 24 hours before, it had been everybody's watch. Perhaps the mate knew whose watch it was. Several men looked at him questioningly. Second and third mates watch us eat, he said, and the word passed the length of the vessel and was relayed aloft to the highest man. The chief mate's men kept doggedly at work subduing and securing the piles one by one, a few they hove over the side to give themselves room to work. The rest, with crowbars and the pull of a wire cable from the donkey engine, they pried and hauled into a semblance of order. The men of the other watches climbed down from the yards where they had been unbending the remnants of the blown-out sails. Usually there was nothing left to unbend but the bolt ropes adorned with a narrow, lacy fringe of canvas. The men moved toward the mess with deliberate steps, slowly, as though they had no real interest in this business of eating. Bert Lindsay slipped into a place at the long, narrow mess table and filled his bowl with thick bean soup. Then he sat balancing the bowl of soup in his left hand while he ate with his right. Two rows of soup bowls the length of the table hung stationary in the air like compasses and gimbals while the vessel rolled beneath them. Presently, the bowls clattered down on the table and hard hands, some of them blood-stained, reached for the meat and potatoes. "'Pass the salt horse,' someone demanded. They were the first spoken words at the silent table. Bert almost jumped at the sound. Another seaman called for coffee, but for the most part the men reached for what they wanted or waited their turn. All ate as though with a determination to wipe out the memory of their enforced fast. Every few moments the cook thrust a beaming face through the galley door to watch them, his very look seeming to say, there, you see, I'm doing my job. Bert glanced up and down the rows of familiar faces, seeking one face that was not there. Then he remembered Pete Condon got bumped too. He's out of his head, the mate had told the skipper. As the men's appetites were appeased, they began to talk. The hot food had worked a wonderful change in them. Their eyes had lost their dullness. Their shoulders had recovered from their weary droop. The talk was all in one vein, and Bert listened intently. I tell you, this is a wrecked ship, said one, and it's only by the grace of God that she still floats. Aye, agreed another, but she was a wrecked ship when we sailed. Now is just a little worse. Once, put in Fred von Bergen, I saw a full-rigged ship with sails and rigging in such condition as the Queen of Asia's. She sailed out of Bremen for Buenos Aires, and she was never heard from. The men piled their plates high a second time and a third, doing their talking between mouthfuls. Among the few silent ones, Bert noticed Giuseppe Palladini, Dago Gus, who had not yet recovered from his terror, and three green hands, whom the boy guessed to be the three who had funked going aloft. Any pigs left? Someone asked. Eleven live ones and ten dead ones. Einar Nelson volunteered. Twenty went overboard. Yeah, and so did eighteen barrels of old salt horse, said Nick Previson. Yeah, so did eighteen barrels of salt horse, said Nick Previson. Now we'll get canned stuff or nothing. And fresh pork, suggested Nelson. The men brightened at the idea. A big Norwegian pushed back his empty plate and looked up with sudden bitterness. Fresh pork be damned, and all sailing ships he exploded. I wouldn't set foot on the deck of a windjammer again for a half interest in the ship. A chorus of approving grunts and comments followed this outburst. A steamer for mine or I don't sign on next year. 
there's a chicken ranch down near Palo Alto that I'm going to buy when I get back. No more of this dog's life for me, neither. Finishing their meal at almost the same instant, the men rose and returned to the deck. Several took out their pipes and began to fill them, but the third saw them emerge and called. No time for smokes, boys. Take a pinch of snooze and lay aloft. Got to clear away the wreckage. Grumbling and swearing, they obeyed. Some took the third's advice, also, and stuffed snuff into their mouths in lieu of a smoke. In the course of an hour, Bert found an excuse to descend to the deck. He made his way aft, along the littered deck, past the carcasses of the hogs that the piles had killed and prevented from washing over, past a few scattered chunks of salt meat, all that remained of the eighteen barrels that had been lashed against the after deck house, and into the corridor that led through the cabin to the lazarette. Halfway down the corridor, he turned to the left, passed through the officer's mess, and entered the saloon, which he knew was being used for a sick bay. Several mattresses lay on the floor. On one of them sat the second mate, his head bandaged, staring about with dull, unseeing eyes. On another lay a groaning seaman, whom Bert had not missed, cursing his luck between groans. A busted leg, he gritted in answer to Bert's query. Doc says he can't set it till the swelling goes down. It's bad enough to be laid up, but to have to lie here and listen to that lunatic is hell. He jerked his thumb toward the third occupant of the sick bay. He's all the time bleating about somebody's cue and getting square with the Nushigak Salmon Company. Says the company ain't treated him right. Bah, wonder if he thinks he's the only one. It was the third man whom Bert had come to see. Pete Condon lay on his back, seemingly unconscious. Pillows had been stuffed under the edges of his mattress to prevent his falling off, for the bark was still rolling heavily. His scarred face was tense, and his lips twitched as though he were trying to talk in a troubled dream. The boy watched him for several minutes. What if the man's skull were fractured and he died? He, Bert Lindsay, would be responsible. True, the fellow had three times attempted murder, first Hargrave, then Beth, then himself. But Bert shuddered at the thought that he might be responsible for any man's death. Why had he tackled Condon? He had lost control of himself, seen red, felt nothing but blind fury. But after all, the man's injury was due to accident, the sudden roll of the bark, the forgotten wall of the chart house. No, he couldn't excuse himself that way. If Pete Condon died, then he would be responsible, and he would face the music. Presently, the boy knelt down beside the injured man. Condon, he said. Pete Condon. The man's lips stopped twitching and his eyes flew open, but they stared straight up at the white enameled ceiling. He spoke, and it was like the muttering of a corpse. The boy had to listen closely to catch his words. I got the kid, Q, he said. Knocked him from the topsail yard. Now we're both square with the Nushigak Salmon Company. Give me my thousand and I'll clear out. Bert put a hand on the man's arm and shook it gently. Look at me, Pete, he said. Don't you know me? The eyes turned obediently. No, you told us to call you Q and said you had it in for this outfit. You work from number 14 Spofford Alley. That's all I know about you. Now give me my one grand and I'll... Bert felt his heart pounding in his breast. The pockmarked man didn't know who Q was. But Q, Bert decided, was no ordinary criminal. Obviously Condon was merely a tool, but there was more important information to be got if possible. What about the mutiny, Pete? Bert asked. The mutiny of the China gang. It might not be sportsmanlike, the boy thought, to pump a man who was delirious, but this game of life and death and mutiny was hardly a sporting proposition. The scarred face clouded. The storm, Condon said. It was to be tonight, but there is a storm. They are afraid. In a few days I... Shut up! Bert sprang to his feet to face Dr. Heiss, who had advanced threateningly toward him, glowering hatred from a face whose flint-like hardness could not be hidden even by his black beard. As he drew close to the boy, his threatening attitude left him. His face softened, and a crafty look came into his eyes. He spoke with a voice that Bert guessed was intended to be kind and fatherly. "'Get outside, my boy,' he said, 
Don't you know better than to bother a man who's out of his head? Bert had faced the man's threatening advance without flinching. It would have been a pleasure to sink his fists into the point of that beard, but he winced at the my boy. Reluctantly, he turned away and walked back to the deck. Should he go to the captain with the little that he had learned about the mutiny? He decided not to. The bark's master had plenty to think about, and the mutiny had been delayed indefinitely. The information could wait until he had another chance to talk to the pockmarked man, but he shrewdly surmised that he would not get another chance. Bert walked forward to go aloft and help unbend the remains of the four lower topsail. A few of the China gang, he noticed, had appeared on deck. Their faces were gaunt and drawn, and in their eyes was an expression of dread terror. Even in the faces of a few stolid old Chinese who were dragging sodden quilts and blankets up from the forward tween decks, fear was written plainly. Bert wondered if Fong Tuck had been afraid. Chuckling at the thought, he began to climb. As he reached the level of the lifeboats on the roof of the forward deck house, his chuckle suddenly stopped. For there, his back against the boat, sat the old hatchet man, placidly wetting a long, wicked-looking knife. Bert could not explain why the sight sent a chill up and down his spine. By supper time, when all hands came down from aloft, four patched and dirty sails had been bent on and set, enough to enable the bark to lie on the wind, though in a strong breeze, a twenty-mile wind, the speed that she made was pitifully slow. At least her motion and direction checked the terrible rolling in the seas that were still running high, making it easier to work and possible to rest. At four bells, between the dog watches, the mate sent his own watch and the second's watch below. Rest. They had nearly forgotten the meaning of the word. Two more hours, Bert thought, and then eight hours of sleep. But at eight bells, which marked the end of his watch on deck and the beginning of his two watches below, Bert went aft, slipped through the deserted officer's mess, and into the temporary sickbay. Pete Condon was in a deep sleep. The boy spoke to him and shook him without causing the slightest break in his heavy breathing. Doped, Bert muttered to himself. Doc wasn't taking any chances on his talking again. Then, Bert continued down the corridor, shook off his boots, and climbed into his bunk, too tired to bother with the formality of undressing. In less than five minutes, he was sound asleep.